Hello, this is Toner Quinn, editor of the Journal of Music, and this is the Journal of Music podcast. My guest on this week's podcast is Harper Leisha Kelly, recipient of the 2020 T.G. Cahar Gratham Keol Award, which is the main annual award for traditional musicians in Ireland. Leisha tells me about how things have changed radically for the Irish harp in the last couple of decades, about her life as a full-time musician, and what the award means to her. Leisha, could we start at the beginning and could you tell me about how you started in music? Yeah, the very first thing would be um, growing up in a house with, with plenty of music and I'm the youngest so um, I have two sisters and a brother and uh, they all played. My father plays the piano and there was great, there was always a great mixture of music going on in the house and um, I suppose I'm, the first thing would have been piano because they were always at the piano in the house and I would have learned that way and I know that my father had a very had a hang up about um, not being able to read music. He was very musical and his mother wouldn't let the boys learn music. And um, it was one of the first things he did when he settled in Westport was to learn piano, learn how to read music. I don't know, was it something uh, to do with his association with tra- uh, traditional mus- musicians not being able to pl- read music and poverty? I don't I know, some weird... Yeah, I don't know what it is. So he insisted on us learning to read music. So he taught me to read music really young, like sort of four. I would have been sitting up reading. Well, I suppose nowadays that's not that young, really. There's a lot of people doing. Do you find that that was an advantage? No. (laughs) Why not? I find that, I think looking back, it's a disadvantage because I was pretty good at reading then all the way up. and, And then I would have, you know, done all the sort of exam type things and... Like, I mean, I would have learned whistle as well at school. No, not at school, but we all did whistle at home with um, the gang of them, you know. Um, and from the, about the age of six, seven, um, that and they went kind of separately, side by side. Um, that when I kind of got into triad in my teens, I found I was slower than my friends at learning tunes who were fiddle players or accordion players. Or, yeah, definitely, I definitely. Because you don't think your ear was as developed? Yeah. Sure. So you started on the piano and worked your way through the grades and then at what age did you start playing the harp? Uh, the harp arrived around when I was 12, just gone 12. And were there any other harpers in the area? There were. Uh, there was Anne-Marie Scanlon, who was my teacher. She was from um, Lewisburg and she was uh, she had a lovely classical technique and she was taught by the great Nancy Calthorpe, who's a, a legend in the harping world, um, especially for... Um, singing with harp accompaniment so that's where I was dropped into not realising that world I just was dropped into that's what was the harping world at the time really and why the harp though? oh um, I heard it when I was younger in our house um, a girl came playing it and I was just bowled over like absolutely a real moment in my life yeah was this at a house session? yeah house sessions they were great. what age were you then? nine remember it kind of clearly all right you know and what did you what did you hear I don't know maybe it was the look of it or I don't know that it must have been the sound I don't really remember that I just remember that moment and going oh my god and then I was last at home I suppose the rest of them um were gone and dad would have wanted one of us to play pipes or harp and he was a bit late coming to the party really <laughs> and what do your siblings play then well they're same thing piano but they would have gone to boarding school and done classical violin so um, Shifa returned and did um, a bit of trad fiddle and then uh, Mern sings and uh, my brother's the eldest and he was, he, he's more into kind of contemporary and rock and that kind of thing. So when you say you were the last one left, the others were, were gone to boarding school? Yeah. And did you go to boarding school? No. I went to school in Westport. Was there, there is a strong traditional music culture in Westport. Was it as strong then? No, it wasn't really. Um, it really became so much stronger after Matt Malloy came in 89. Um, but as a teenager, there were great local musicians like Pat Freel and Nim Grittis flying still. They're mighty musicians. Um, and the local cultists like that, you know, there would have been a few. And then very strong sort of down Newport side. Um, but they were amazing to me. When I was sort of 13, 14, they would say, oh, wow, Alicia's playing the harp. Come and play in the kind of Wednesday cultists concert. And I, they would say, play along. And I wouldn't know, I wouldn't have the tools to play along and had, wouldn't know what to do, and they were just so, yeah, sorry, they're just so so generous and nice and 
gentle and encouraging to say, just play, it's fine. Try, you know, they let me fumble along and probably destroy what they were playing. <laughs> but what had you started playing on the harp? Was it oh, traditional harp repertoire or was it, it was dance this, music? or No, it was the compliment for these songs. I see. Now, Amory was a beautiful singer, beautiful soprano voice. <clears throat> and as you can hear, <laughs> I have a beautiful <laughs> alto. No, I, I just wasn't my thing at all. Even the singing wasn't cool. The repertoire was super uncool. It was the Blue Handkerchief and Jimmy Mavila Store. And it, even though I love that tune now, those kind of things that were like dated by about sort of 30, 40 years. Did you even feel it at that age in your mid-teens that, it, that the harp wasn't cool at all? Oh, no, it definitely was uncool. Yeah, but shocking. But you persisted with it. Yeah, I know. That's the <laughs> stubborn streak. Like if I was bringing the harp to school for any reason, which didn't happen too often, but uh, I'd wait till everybody was gone in before I'd walk in with it. Really? Yeah, mortified. But at what stage then did you start to sort of transition your repertoire into playing mainstream reels, jigs, hornpipes on the harp? Um, maybe it was f- uh, getting into flas and stuff. Um... And even the harp competitions exposed me to other stuff. Uh, such a small world, there were very few people that play in the harp and connacht at the time. So up to Keyju for the Caroline competition and Granard and that sort of thing. And uh, it was great. It was a nice little kind of, you felt part of a little kind of community and you, you knew everybody. It was great. Um, but it was very niche. <laughs> yeah. And then going to the Flas then, of course, that kind of sparked. Even though I would have been diddly eye and the whistle and stuff, um, and playing in the kind of local cultists, it hadn't happened till you, which is normal enough, till you meet your your peers, your teens, the teens that were playing. So we, the, the parents got a group together under uh, Jenny Kilroy, a great musician out of Westport. And uh, we were from all over, Ackill, Newport, Westport, out as far as Car Kennedy on the, on the north side. And it was great. We were all, it was the first time, it was like a group of keol. And we were all different instruments and different talents. And we were all very... Uh, shy and uh, but that was brilliant because mm. it was a w- real wake up call to me that I really wasn't at the races compared to what they were but you could already play tunes on the whistle so it was a matter of applying that repertoire to the harp yeah but there weren't many people or were there playing jigs and reels on the harp were there at well, that time I certainly wouldn't have heard anyone anyone till maybe Etna Donnelly maybe uh, a Fla Kilkenny with that but 88 or something like that. And when you started playing the harp, did you find you had a natural facility for it because of the piano? Yeah, that was definitely an aid. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Well, you've got all the, the theory behind why you're changing key here, up here. Um, that's that's all. Well, I mean, that came from the classical background on the piano. Mm. Um, and I found that when I'm teaching now, kids who have none of that background I fry their heads on having to know their keys because it's really it's really important so it is important then the theory side and being able to read music in, uh, in your own not teaching not so much reading but mm-hmm. yeah um, well you're just cutting off a whole world of being able to read somebody else's arrangement you know um, and that's one of the biggest things I would get asked for is my left hand for a certain tune or um, you know at any of these like the Willie Clancy, you'd have people come up, will you give her an hour and listen to her flat tunes or something? And um, I'd say, no, I, I, that's not my thing. I, I just, I teach the melody and I give you an indication of where the left hand is going. I don't like to say, it's the low D here. Up to the F. I don't like nailing it in. Uh, I like them to come up with their own, you know, as much mm-hmm. as possible. So I find it very hard to commit <laughs> uh, an arrangement to paper. Right. You know. Um, but your technique in playing the harp... You use the nails yeah. to play the melody, mm-hmm. which is quite unique. Um, How did that develop? Well, Jeannie, that was all a mistake, really, <laughs> back in the time. Uh, I was all my 20s playing solid. Jeannie, there was hardly a night we didn't play uh, here in Galway. And then um, I, I was moved up to Donegal and the band had finished, the Bumblebees. And there weren't that many gigs. And I had about a month with no tunes, uh, which was unheard of at the time. What year was this? Uh, around um, 2000. And the the nails started to grow because at the time you would never have a, even a teensy hint of it because you're horse and if you get a little nail you hear it, feel it and hear it. I said, Jeannie, I'll give it a go. Sure, Jeannie, they've been playing with the nails for hundreds of years. There might be a reason why. And 
yeah. But up until that point, you've been playing with the finger pads. Yeah, like everybody else, yeah. Throughout the 90s. Yeah. And then when you started using your nails rather than finger pads, did you prefer the sound? Yeah, I definitely did, but it was difficult to change. It's like having to alter the, the whole technique. Did you feel you were connecting in, like you say, that that it was the traditional way of playing the early harp with the nails? Did you feel like you were connecting in with that tradition or something? Not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> I suppose one of the primary um, purposes was I was playing with Steve, Steve Cooney on the guitar, and he was playing Spanish guitar. So we sounded the same. And the nail gave me a little, a little, <laughs> little advantage, you know. You can hear the little zing off the nail. Right. You know, and, and it's the same then when you're playing with, you know, anything, flute, fiddle, pipes, whatever. The little bit of nail just gives it that little tiny kick, yeah. You mentioned earlier on that when Matt Malloy moved to Westport, that had a big impact on the traditional music culture there. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, it was, it's really before, and Westport is a before and after Matt Malloy because it was a sleepy one horse town. And then Matt came and I mean, he first of all, he opened, he brought the chieftains. We were all, wow, like. This amazing. is when he opened up Matt Malloy's pub. Yeah. Right. And um, and he, he the weekend was the Mayo Flowers in Westport. So it was a big deal, you know. Um, and then from then on, you never know who was going to be coming through the pub playing tunes. Were you a teenager? Yeah. And it was just at the right time for me, you know, just musically, just go, wow, you appreciate well, I would, of course, know Matt anyway, you know, um, his music, I mean, not personally, but, you know, to, you know, he's a icon of mm. yeah, flute playing, you know. So did you start playing in Matt Malloy's pub then? Um, not too much, you would have been a bit young, and then a couple of years later, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit then about, say, when you left school, did you go music, start playing music full time? Well, first of all, I went to Maynooth. Uh, uh, well, f- I repeated the leaving and I went to, actually went to Kymore Abbey. And I was going back to get more points. Not, it wasn't points back then, what was it? Just better results, wasn't it? Um, for civil engineering, would you believe? And um, Sister Carol out in Kylemore, amazing, amazing Sister Carol. She changed my life and uh, kind of showed me what I had, really. Um, and said, what you, you know, had musically? Yeah, you know, she was an amazing teacher. Uh, however it happened, I went to Maynooth and did music and Irish there and economics and um, I really enjoyed Maynooth um, but the course wouldn't have at the time had any trad whatsoever um, so But what did that sister say to you to make you understand what you had? Yeah I can't remember now I suppose I was enjoying my music more also that same year I met Liz Kane and Morella and Morella was in the Clifton Community School and Liz was a day pupil so we used Morella. to Morella uh, Morella Murray played Morella the box Murray. from from, from um, Clegan uh, from Cladilough and so we, we used to meet up playing often. Tell me then at UC, UCC you became immersed in the Trish music scene down there Yeah the music was good in UCC um, very strong uh, trad sock and there was even a harp society because <laughs> there was a few of us there and they weren't all doing music um, and I used to give Michal a hard time I used to really enjoy his classes and um, yeah, was, Wait, what do you mean by that? Well, he'd he'd slip up with something in class, and I'd have to, I'd have to. With regard to the harp, yeah, or some of the history or something, because there there wouldn't have been as people who would might know the stuff that I would have known, or I wouldn't even realise that I had the knowledge I had really kind of you know. But um, he he loved that, you know. So we, we had great crack. What kind of discussions would you have? Oh, uh, just about the old harping world and. You know, and then I, I knew that he had done the work on John O'Sullivan's, you know, um, the Carolyn, uh, the bunting, sorry. And, you know, um, I don't know, he, he he was delighted as somebody, I suppose, looking back, had an interest. Um, but then he was, I remember at the end of the year, maybe it might have been into the following year, they were doing an open day in UCC and he asked me to play. And I played and I remember him doing a double take, listening to me. And it was from that that he told Philip King to ask me on that programme at the time, which was the River Sound. And what was Michal's, Michal Asulwan's perspective on the harp at that stage? Well, he had great respect for it, which was wonderful. There wouldn't have been that, say, in Maynooth as such. Uh, so that was wonderful, you know. That trad was a real respected part of the the whole syllabus in, in UCC, which, is, which was amazing. I know it's all completely changed. The whole world has changed since that. You know, this is all pre-river dance even, you know. Mm. So... Um, what were you playing when Michal Sulon did a double take? The jigs. What jigs? <laughs> Brendan Rings jigs. Brendan Rings jigs. Brendan Rings jigs, yeah. yeah. And was it because you were playing... I don't know. Tunes? Tunes possibly, yeah. Yeah. Because originally, 
Philip uh, Philip King asked me to play on this programme that was coming up. What year was that? 94. This was when Michal Asulam was presenting The River of Sound yeah. and he asked you to be a contributor and to play on it. Yeah. Uh, 1994. Yeah. OK. Tell us about that. Yeah, poor old Philip. He, he rang me. I didn't know. I mean, we knew who he was because of bringing it all back home had been on. But uh, so it was, when you got home and the message was Philip King rang, we were all excited and you had to go down to the payphone to ring him back. And uh, um, he said, well, yeah, we're recording in Kidvara Castle and we'd love to have you. And I said, well, I, I won't do it. <laughs> Because I didn't want to be the Colleen with the Guna in the castle. And he just thought that was hilarious. And he moved the shoot to Nuns Island. I imagine that's not so bad. But, um, yeah, that's where I was at the time. I was really kind of, um, yeah. So you, so you almost declined that opportunity. I know. It's not amazing. Because you didn't want to be the traditional All I could see was... And a kind of, you know, wide shot or, you know, <laughs> kind of uh, with looking out the castle with the girl playing the hair. I just was having major problems with that idea of being on the telly like that. So you were very conscious of that stereotype. Of Absolutely. The, of the Harper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you resisted that. Absolutely. Were you consciously trying to change people's ideas? No, I that? wasn't out to change. I just wasn't going to do that, like... And I, d- I didn't realise, the, the, you know, the possible, you know, consequences of that, really. Um, but then fair play to Philip. Me almost has said to him, get her, like, for this show. And he said, I want you to play Carolyn. And I said, well, if I do Carolyn, will you let me play a set of reels or jigs or something as well? And he goes, yeah, no problem. And he was kind of, you know, getting bossed by me. But he, d- he, he didn't mind either. Fair play to Philip, yeah. So... Um, when when that happened, in fact, it was in the middle of Milton Malbay. We'd come up to go away to record, which wasn't, you know, when we much sleep had and stuff. But anyway, um, so I recorded uh, Carolyn Peace. So I think it was the uh, Carolyn's receipt at the time, and then uh, the famous jigs, which are the tunes that I got off Brendan when I would be down in UCC. This uh, is the Piper Brendan. Really. Yeah, Piper, and now Harper, fantastic Harper, um, and and such a lovely composer. When River Sound was broadcast, and you were on that series playing traditional Irish tunes. It was perceived as quite new. To be I know, isn't it funny? Yeah. Uh, what impact did that have on you then? Oh, everything changes before and after. Like, uh, we were just in Galway playing tunes. And then all of a sudden I had a gig. Do you know, getting paid kind of, you know, it was really huge, huge step. And in fact, the, the, the programme was launched in 95. And then the, the <laughs> I got asked... Because Michal was doing the, the interval music for the Eurovision, he asked me to be a part of that, and that was phenomenal. And then, what year was that? That was ninety five, um, and and it was an amazing, huge piece. Evelyn Glynnie was playing percussion, and uh, you know it was just Brian Kennedy and Maya Brennan, and all the Brennans, and I can't even remember. There was loads of people in that. So the monks, Glen Stolavi was hologrammed in, and uh, uh, Lilith Solera and um, Shannon singers. But the River of Sound series was quite controversial at the time. I know, imagine. Were you conscious of the controversy around it? It was controversial because some people criticised it because it was espousing a certain, a different type of music. That's how it was perceived. What did you think of that at the time? Well, I was on that Late Late Show where Tony McMahon said um, what he said. <laughs> but uh, I... D- he, said that it, he, he said that he couldn't hear anything Irish in it. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't have agreed with that, like, so... What do you remember about that time then? I remember hearing Eileen Ivers doing her thing and then she was kind of pushing the boat out which seemed at the time gosh it's so not like nowadays but there was so much class music on that programme like Martin O'Connor and Frankie Gavin there was Dermot and Dermot Byrne and uh, Kieran Tours there was Nile Valley there was just you know Cormac Brannock there was so many gorgeous things on it like um, Did you feel that criticism was unfair then? No, I didn't think it was necessarily unfair, but it might have been wrongly attributed to that it wasn't Irish music. Whereas it, that was on the cusp. Of course, Riverdance was 94, wasn't it? So things were moving. So it was inevitable anyway. Or maybe they were just at the right time highlighting it. And this was well, quite transformative for you as a musician in that it sort of launched your career then. Yeah. And... You've been working full-time in music since then. Yeah. Tell me about the life of the 
full time musician. The travelling harper. Yeah. <laughs> I did run into harper going around. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I live absolutely the life. I'm, I'm really, really, it's a privilege. Um, I'm really delighted I have this life. I um, feel really lucky. Um, and then there's the other side where it's tough. You're broke <laughs> constantly. And, um, and I, I, I don't mind that because the, the quality of my life, meeting the people I meet and uh, travelling where I get to travel is just is a gift. And then I find the business part of it difficult, like most artists do, I suppose, really. Um, all Even recording. I don't even enjoy the process of recording. Um, I've had years of it and I am kind of can do it, uh, but it d- definitely doesn't bring about the best to me. And then I find kind of finally got to the bottom of that like say my record that we brought out in 2010 Kesh um, with Martin Brunston he came and brought his gear set me up and went off for a walk for about two or three hours and press record now it's a nightmare afterwards having to deal with you have to go you have to listen to it. but it meant I could play for an hour conscious of the red button and finally get a bit better so it's just a matter of becoming completely comfortable yeah I'm not completely comfortable even still why is that? I, I don't understand it so there's a deep problem psychologically <laughs> it's like oh I have a little bit of a tune great press the button and where did it go just disappeared there how do you feel when you are comfortable performing what are, what do you feel oh, is the, the live gig is your only band really I think you know I, I love uh, just love playing I think and I think that's the same when I go to hear gigs there's nothing like listening to people up close you know just hearing the real deal hearing like natural mistakes even or you know a bit of tuning or what do you feel from either particular tracks or albums that you feel are really representative of you no not really <laughs> not yet you don't feel you've no no done no, that no, yet. no no but i i did learn something in that particular recording of Kesh with martin because martin is coming from a, a different world to to trad and um he was wonderful at telling me that he loved me tuning up. <laughs> he, he said all the fluttering stuff that I do when I'm tuning up, which I take ages to tune up, you know, get the hands, get the, you're in the key, and, and all that world of tuning t- to that key rather than just tuning to a tuner, on the, you know, the electronic tuner. Um, and I would spend ages making sure I was happy with that tuning. And what I'm doing to get there, he loved that music. And he said, you know, you should just record that. And I'm like, no way, you know, it's just as I didn't accept that as any sort of music sort of thing, you know. And then it took me years to go, "Mm, maybe, you know. And then then I was lucky to get a stint in the Tyrone Guthrie Centre from the Mayo County Council. Initially, I didn't enjoy the process. And then I had a great conversation with a a girl. What didn't you enjoy about the process? Just being there for a a week? I don't know. I, I, I had to wait till it clicked. I don't know. Can't even explain that, probably. Sorry. So so are there ambitions then to do another recording? What would that be? What are you looking to try and do then? Well, that stint in the Toronto Guthr- Guthrie Centre gave me the beginning of finding my way into kind of my own music and getting... It, it, I've been, it's been so difficult to go in there and be comfortable with what it is. Uh, it doesn't sit into a jig or a reel or whatever and f- having the confidence like it took me years then to play it on stage this piece was uh, was to do with the, the heron a Mayada Is this the piece you've written? Yeah um, so even to say I've written that piece is difficult for me to say because really what I'm doing is imitating the call of this bird and a conversation with two of them to two birds and it, it just stemmed out from that so so it's taken, taken a long time to say, yes, I've composed that piece that came from there. So you're trying to develop your own language, it sounds like. Yeah, maybe if I could speak about it better, I, I'd be more confident about playing it. But I have, I've got, and I've got lovely reaction from it, which has really helped. Oh my goodness, that, that really... When you've performed it live? Yeah, yeah. And what's it called? Uh, on my other. As well as being a performer, you recently started your own festival. Yeah. Ackle, the Ackle International Harp Festival, which is in its fourth year now? Fifth year this year. Fifth year in yeah. 2020. Yeah. Tell me about why you started a festival in Ackle. Well, I'd love to say I started it, but I didn't. There's a whole fantastic it's committee. It's a committee. It is, absolutely, yeah. But you're the 
sort of you program it. You're the um, artistic director. I don't director. program. No, we program it together. Okay. Um, because of the nature of putting it on in a rural community, um, we need to. I need to hear everybody else's opinion about what would you think that would something that's fantastic that's a bit hardcore mightn't go down with an audience. Do you know it's a very fine balance between that whole thing of a fantastic musician that might be a little bit lost at a mixed audience, you know. So um, initially it was, I was given out for years that we really should have a cool festival in, in Ireland, you know, because I get to travel and every time I travel, they go, oh, you're from Ireland, the country of the harp, you know, especially outside of Europe. They really respect us as this musical nation. It's absolutely phenomenal, but we don't appreciate it at all. Which countries are you talking about? I mean, you've travelled all over the world. But yeah, anywhere. Um, Genie, America, Australia, New Zealand, South America, Africa. Yeah. They tell you we're perceived as the... Yeah. Yeah, and of course, all over Europe. Yeah, mm. yeah, and we really are, and then we actually are the musical country <laughs> as well. It's not just a. Do you feel myth. that? I do definitely. Yeah, because when you go away and you're maybe they ask you to come and play in the school or stuff like that, and you realise you're at a big, I don't know, huge generalisation now. But say in France and you go to the local school and there's 500 primary school, maybe only 30 of them play tunes, whereas play some class of music, prop most likely going to be classical and you'll have the odd one that'll go into but maybe contemporary rock um, do you know they're not tuned into their culture we're so much more tuned into our culture do you know why do you think that has happened or why do you think it's like that yeah it's part and parcel of us isn't it yeah um, I don't know I think maybe we're appreciated more now especially in this time of technology and phones that once you put them down you listen to a bit of music does something to you physically, doesn't it? You can. Do you think the traditional music culture is actually getting stronger? Yeah. And where do you see that? Probably in the numbers. The kids, the amount of kids playing, I'm saying kids, but I mean teenagers, you know, proficiently, is phenomenal compared to my day. Do you know, that's only, whatever, 25 years ago, whatever. It's like absolutely it's outstanding. And there's been huge, a huge rise in the number of harpers as well. Absolutely. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, there are more harpers playing now than in the 1900s, in the 1800s, in the 1700s and possibly back further, we don't know. But it's absolutely so strong at the moment. And what does that mean to you as a harper who remembers playing as a teenager when it was uncool and for now to see all these yeah, young people Yeah, it's amazing. It? That's absolutely... Thank God. <laughs> Is that one of the reasons you start your festival, to celebrate this? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. To... And to also highlight to these young people that there's way more to the harp than just the little Irish diddly eye. So that's why it's International Harp Festival. We bring other ones in, especially the kind of South Americans are really doing fantastic stuff. And everything else, you know, we, we had for the first time last year wonderful jazz harpers from, from Wales on, on the concert harp. And it was electric concert harp, so it was super duper cool. And he was a lovely, lovely young fellow. Who is that? Ben Creighton Griffiths, absolutely wonderful player. And then we have, you know, we might have an electric harp player from Scotland or um, somebody doing traditional Polish music or, you know, any, anything. Because the harp is in most cultures, you know. Well, not most, but in an awful lot, you know. The concerts that I've attended, and it takes place at the end of October, um, they're really well supported by the community as well. Yeah, isn't that wonderful, yeah. Very, I mean, for a festival that's only a few years old, there's a real integration. Yeah. And that must make a huge difference. It does. That was inspired by the popularity of, like, the Willie Clancy Week and also um, the Skull Grivery Guidor, that people, and you know, like um, Ballyferreter, the Skull Culinary, that people will go out west and make the effort to go so far out when they know the crack goes with, you know. And um, it is a beautiful place. It is used to be a huge holiday destination. Um, our tourism with windows is uh, closing in a bit more now as the years go by. But we're a bit more focused on that now. Um, so this is like in the tourist world, in the Fall Jarland world, it's like a shoulder season, being in October. But we couldn't put this on in the summer because we'd, we'd have no beds for people to come. But also, it's the, re the reason we went in October is because of the Samhain. And the Harpers used to meet at Tara at Samhain triannually. So. Historically? Yeah, absolutely. This year it was announced that you are the T.G. Cahar Gratham Kill Musician of the Year. Um, the award ceremony is coming up on the 23rd of February. 
Tell me, what did that mean to you when you received that news? Um, cheapers, I couldn't believe it anyway, for a start. Um, also, Prunchies from TG Carr, she rang me on the Thursday of the Harp Festival. <laughs> Right when we were trying to rehearse the opening night and the Mexicans had come in the door, <laughs> they were looking at the harp and I was like, well, there's Punchy's ringing. I might as well answer her because like, we're not getting anything done here. And I just couldn't, I couldn't take it in, you know. And then I, had, I wasn't able to think or speak about it the whole weekend because we were full on. Was that difficult? No, not at all. I had no time. There was no headspace. There was none. Um, and even the week after, because I was looking after the Mexicans, they were staying for a week and going on up to leash and that. So, it, yeah. So then bit by bit, I... I found it a very difficult process to accept that they would want to give this to me. Um, and I've been analysing that as well because I think it's a huge honour. I really do. It really is a huge honour. And then I think it's fantastic for the harp. But all my life, in my head, I've never been good enough. So to, to suddenly say, well, they think you're good. <laughs> it's been a hard acceptance, you know. Like... I, I've been at a couple of the Grathams, like I, I got to play with um, Matt at his, uh, the Chieftains and uh, Tommy, uh, Tommy Peoples and um, like to be in the same breath as Tommy Peoples, Matt Malloy, Liam Flynn, Martin O'Connor, Mary Bergen, all these unbelievable, my heroes musically. And also, you know, personally, they're such fabulous crack and, um, you know, just wonderful the people is just, the fortunes of the Irish harp have been pretty much transformed in the past couple of decades. Yeah. The numbers, the recognition from UNESCO of the harping tradition. Have things changed enough for you? Has the image of the Irish harp changed in Ireland completely? It, it's changed a lot for sure, but not completely because there's a long world to go. Um, I'm so excited to see all these a lot of harp ensembles going on across the country um, and they're buzzing. The kids are buzzing playing together, which is wonderful. Um, I wouldn't have had any of that kind of opportunity, you know. But but I'd love for your average person to be more proud of the fact that the harp is a symbol of their country. Not just as a symbol, but because it is this cool musical instrument. Leisha, thank you very much. Falter Rhodes. Thanks for listening to the Journal of Music podcast. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or follow us on SoundCloud. This episode was presented by Toner Quinn and produced by Shannon McNamee. Thank you to Flirt FM at the National University of Ireland in Galway, where these podcasts are recorded. For more on the Journal of Music, visit journalofmusic.com.